the Baroque. I will use this first slide to do a little orientation and give you some time to jot down a few notes about the Baroque. For starters, the Baroque is a fairly long period. It's what comes after the Renaissance and before the Neoclassical era. That puts it somewhere between 1600 and 1750, but don't get too hung up on the dates. One of the fun things about the Baroque is that it includes visual arts, but also a defined musical style and the emergence of drama. Today, we're we'll using the visual arts, painting in particular, to highlight the stylistic elements of the Baroque. But you can see the same ideas playing out in the works of musicians like Bach and Vivaldi, or in the works of playwrights like Shakespeare or Moliere. Let's revisit the Renaissance to remember where we left off. This is Raphael's School of Athens. Classical subject, three-point perspective, very geometrical uh, showing off that depth. And here's the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. Man is God's perfect creation. We have some use of light and shadow over on the right side to create a, a sense of depth. But what is missing from this, and something we're going to see in the Baroque, is passion, emotion, complexity. In this image, man is passive. God is reaching out, but it hardly seems like the most important thing ever. I want you to contrast that last image with this statue by Bernini called the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. It's a highly emotional, spiritually intense experience. And you want to look at the expression on her face. She is definitely feeling the piercing love of God represented by the arrow the angel is carrying. Okay. So look, some things to look for in the Baroque would be drama, emotion, complexity. An important transitional movement between the Renaissance and the Baroque, so sometimes you classify it as the late Renaissance, sometimes it's the early Baroque period, is something called mannerism. In this image by El Greco, you see some vivid colors and a highly emotional scene. So this is the taking of Christ. Uh, you also begin to see the use of light to highlight certain areas of action to increase dramatic tension, not just to create depth. This painting is a Rembrandt. It's Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer. Like the Raphael, it is a classical subject. However, here we clearly see that Aristotle is not idealized. Rembrandt does a wonderful job with the eyes. We have a sense that Aristotle is really thinking deeply about something. The light here highlights those eyes, leaving much of the rest of the figure in shadow. There's also an important design element. The downward glance of Aristotle moves diagonally towards the bust of Homer. The glance of Homer moves towards the chain, the very detailed chain on Aristotle, which then wraps up in the cloak and takes your eyes back to Aristotle's face again. This image is the card sharps by Caravaggio, one of my favorite painters. Here, you, the viewer, are watching this card game unfold and watching the cheating as it's going on. The diagonals we saw in the Rembrandt are clear here also, marking a contrast with the geometric rigidity of the Renaissance. The raised eyebrows and the holes in the gloves of the man at the center of the painting give you a sense of being involved in some dramatic action. This is Caravaggio's Judith beheading Holhofernes, which is a scene from the Old Testament. Here, the crimson drapes mimic the spray of the crimson blood gushing out of the still dying Holofernes. Look on the right side of the painting at the tension in the hands of the old woman. Okay. See how the light, which is coming from the top left of the image, falls across Holofernes' face, gleaming off of his eye. Okay. Very dramatic. Now this is a Vermeer, and it's a Dutch painting. And I want you to contrast this young woman with the Renaissance picture of Giovanni Arlofino and his bride. Okay, the same use of the window and the light coming through the window, but 
here we have a sense that we're privy to some intimate moment between these two. The map on the wall and his uniform clearly place this during the 1600s and are incredible details the painter is using to tell the story, which really is another one of those important characteristics of that Baroque period. Toward the end of the Baroque, a new style developed called the Rococo. This carries the fanciful, ornate, detailed approach even further. This painting is by Poussin, depicting John the Baptist, so still a classical subject, uh, but with a great detail, especially in the depiction of nature, you should not be confusing this with the Renaissance. Okay. Also from the Rococo, this is a Watteau. It should remind you of the ornate, frilly environs of the, the palace at Versailles, the chateau at Versailles. And so this is, if you're thinking Rococo, this is kind of your model in your mind, ornate, flowery, showy. Okay. So what about the relationship of the artist to society? In the Renaissance, artists were like other skilled craftsmen. They often had a workshop and they were organized in craft guilds. These artists found themselves working on commissions for wealthy patrons like the Medici or the Popes. As we enter the Baroque, we begin to see the emergence of the artist as an independent commercial entity. This Rembrandt that you're looking at was paid for by the wealthy Dutch merchants pictured. They wanted him, not his workshop. In the Broke, artists were, more, were less likely to be retained by a court and paid for a considerable time, and more likely to be commissioned to do a single work for this or that person. On the one hand, this raised the status of an individual artist like Rubens, who painted this image of Jupiter and Callisto. However, it also meant the artists were subject more to the uncertainties of the market, limiting their independence. Rubens needed to make his women look voluptuous and sensual to appeal to his private buyers, in the same way Shakespeare was under pressure to keep cranking out new hit plays. <laughs> 